Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. Anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So we're reached the end of the close of our study on the book of James. Uh, I hope that you not just understood the book of James better, but that your commitment to living the Christian life has become more resolute and your relationship with God has deepened as a result of our time spent in James. It's quite a, he wrote a lot of challenging things. As you're no doubt aware, James' letter is very intentionally designed to take your faith and your commitment to God and make it practical, not just theoretical. An outward Thing, not just an internal thing. Remember early on in James, the author said, your faith, if it is not evidenced by outward actions, is dead. Chapter 2. It's rendering faith that that works is dead in many of the translations. It says the same thing, really. Quite frankly, though, we have a whole lot of self-professing Christian who easily fall into that dead faith category today. Looking at them, you can't tell any difference between them and their atheist co-worker. And in fact, their atheist neighbor might actually look more like Christ outwardly than they do. Have you ever noticed the folks from the South? I'm from California, so I'm not from anywhere. But <laughs> have you ever noticed that uh, in the South, they talk just a little bit different. They got, got some phrases like, bless their heart, which doesn't really mean bless their heart. <laughs> or y'all. Spoken correctly, not you all. And if we go around the country up north, in Minnesota, in Minnesota, you betcha. Boston, you gotta go park your car. And that's what James is saying throughout his letter. Not that, that we have different dialects, but that Christians should be easy to pick out of a crowd. That should be evidence in how we live our lives. To wrap this letter, you mentioned several ways we have opportunities to demonstrate the faith that we have in our lives. There are some evidences. Faith is evidenced by faith is evidenced by how we handle trial and difficulty in life. Do we have faith that God's going to see us through? How do we handle success? Do we let it get to our head and become arrogant? Narcissistic. What about temptations? How do we handle those and try to take us off track in our walk with Christ? Evidence by the way we use our words. And if we speak more than listen, we got two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we talk. It's also evidenced by the level of concern you have for widows and orphans that was straight from Jesus. It's evidence in the prejudices you have, and it demonstrates through your words and actions where you stand. How you help those in need is another evidence. And how you approach plans for the future. The future is different for believers than it is for non-believers. I mean, we're all going to face judgment, but we know that we have a Savior in Christ. Do we ask God to rubber stamp our plans? Or do you, we seek to know his plan for our life? 
today's text, James closes out his letter by writing actually one of his uh, more sympathetic portions. Is anyone among you in trouble? We'll let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Get the elders of the church and anoint you oil and pray over them. The prayer of faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So what he's saying is all of your life, every part of your life ought to flow out of the richness of your relationship with God. It would be impactful in everything that we do as it flows through us and as it comes back to us. way to look at this is if you're in trouble pray about it. If you're happy praise God about it. If you're sick on any level, psychological cognitive, emotional, spiritual call the elders and have them pray over you and God will heal you. He will set you free. What James is talking about here is the foundation of every situation in life. Our relationship with God is not primarily about the destination, spending eternity with him in heaven. That's a great thing to, to have in front of us. But it's more about the process of getting there. We enter into the kingdom when we say yes to Christ. He wants to walk with you. He wants to walk with me in and through every single situation in this life as preparation for all of eternity spent with him. What's your first response when you get in trouble? Or when you get sick or when you're happy? What's the first time? Is it God? God ought to be our first thought. And too often, he's our last resort. James instructs us to call the elders if you're sick and have them come and anoint you with oil and pray over you. And the prayer offered in faith will make a person well. And I want you to know that we do believe in this practice here at this church. But the initiative is placed not on the elders to hunt down the sick and pray for them, but on the person who is sick to contact the elders or contact me. And if you call and ask, we'll, we'll make arrangements for you to be seen by elders, by me, by several of us. We'll come over, we'll anoint you, we'll pray over you. The oil throughout scripture is symbolic of God's presence in the moment. And elders in the church are people with great faith and deep commitment to God. However, I would add that not everyone they have prayed over has been immediately healed. Although many have been healed, or their life has been transformed, or extended beyond the expectation, the prognosis that a doctor gave. And then they received the greatest healing and ultimate release through death and being united with Christ at our final destination. Others have received the healing through a profound sense of peace in the midst of the struggle. Profound sense of peace. The peace that passes understanding. The peace that doesn't make any sense. In the context of this instruction on healing, James mentions confessing our sins to one another. Secrets kill. So confess to one another, but please only do that with somebody who's safe, who can maintain confidentiality. I can't tell you how many stories, and particularly in recovery, because part of the 12 steps is the process of confession. And I can't tell you how many have, folks have been violated by choosing the wrong person to listen to their embarrassments and their struggle. The importance, though, of confession cannot be overstated. It just can't. Romans 12, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you, metamorph you, into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you're going to learn to know what God's will for you is, his good, pleasing, and perfect 
will because of the privilege and authority God has given us or given me I give you I give each of you this morning this is Paul talking about me don't think you're better than you really are be honest in your evaluation of yourselves measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given us just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function so it is with Christ's body so it is we are many parts of one body and we truly belong to each other I come back into that passage often I would love to see a church live that out where we belonged to each other where we were there for each other there's something powerful and effective about telling someone else about your struggle with sin and then having them hold you accountable to your recovery in that. And through the years, I've been in accountability relationships with other guys, and it's a powerful deterrent for sinning. You know, you know that someone is going to have, be asking you about that area of your life when you meet. If they're going to be asking you, you don't want to lie, so it keeps you on the straight and narrow. Can't help else, anyway. And the more people that know, the more accountability partners. I have, or people in recovery would have. And I've not found a true revival that didn't start with confession. Even recently at Asbury Seminary, that was begun by students in a state of confession of their sin and it led to a worldwide confessional impact. James 5. Talking about Elijah. Elijah was a human being, even if we are. He was a prophet, but he was just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't for three and a half years. I imagine the farmers were pretty unhappy. And then again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. This is an illustration of the potential power of our prayer. We don't do that for us. We do that to honor and glorify God. James points out the effectiveness of Elijah, the prophet, in his prayers. Elijah, at one point in his ministry, prayed for it not to rain. And it was a dry season for three and a half years. And then he demonstrated God's power and superiority over the pagan god Baal. Baal, he prayed again and God opened up the heavens and it began to rain again. That's just one example of an extraordinary life filled with miracles. And yet James says that Elijah is just like us, just like you and me. God is claiming through James' words that you have the same potential power and effectiveness to your prayers that Elijah had in his prayers. Because it's really not about you and me. It's always about God. But the key phrase is the phrase he prayed earnestly when Elijah prayed he prayed with confidence I want to read this to you it's a long passage but it's Elijah it's out of 1st Kings chapter 18 talking about the power of prayer so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah when he saw Elijah he said to him is that you you troubler of Israel I've not made trouble for Israel Elijah replied but you and your father's family have you've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals the Baals heard it a lot of different ways. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 uh, Car of Carmel. So Ahab sent words throughout all Israel and they all came and Elijah went before the people and said, how long are you going to waver between these two opinions, between Baal and the true God? And he said to the priests of Baal, those 450 prophets, get too bold and you guys go for it. Let, let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves, cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Offer her the other one, put it on the wood, and I won't set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. We'll see, who, we'll see who, whose fire burns. So they took the bowl, they prepped it, and then they went after it. You know, they're cutting themselves, they're doing all kinds of dancing around the altar, the, the prophets of Baal. And then Elijah began to taunt them, you need to be louder, obviously. Because your, your God can't hear you. Then Elijah said they kept going and it didn't, nothing happened. So then Elijah 
said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and, and repaired the altar of, of the Lord, which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying of the tribes, say, your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built on the altar of the name of the Lord, dug a trench around it, and, and uh, it was deep enough to hold two sails of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the pole, laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill large jars with water. Not gasoline, water. Of course, they probably didn't have gasoline, but still. So they poured it on the first time, they poured it on the altar the second time, poured it on the third time. And then Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know who the Lord is. And that you're turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood and stones, the soil, licked up the water in the trenches. When all the people saw it, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord he is God. Then Elijah commanded him, get those prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. So they didn't. Elijah said they had to eat and drink for their sound of a heavy rain. <laughs> you know, he and Elijah, you know, it's like, what? They had went out to eat and drink. Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees. Go and look forward to see, he told his servant. Uh, servant yeah, there's nothing out there. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant said, there's a cloud. There's a cloud. It's small, it's small as the, hands, the man's hand, but it's rising from the sea. And Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, the heavy rain started falling, and Ahab threw it off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, tucking his cloak into his belt. He ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. If God would describe our prayer life, what description would he use, do you think? Would it be fervent or lackadaisical or somewhere in between? It's not about flowery words. It's not about all the hoopla. And football fans are a great example of cheering their favorite team. But there's a difference between cheering for God. That fervency, that intensity is important. Elijah had to pray with fervency and earnestly. And that's what James is pointing out. My dear friends, if you know people who wandered off, don't write them off, bring them back, right? Me cheering on my favorite team from the comfort of my living room is not going to change the outcome of that game one bit. But you praying fervently for someone, guess what? That can change everything. James ends this letter by mentioning the most important and yet difficult thing what to do within the body of Christ. Recognize a fellow believer who is slowly turning their back on God and gently bring them back. Gently go after them. Gently get them and you have love, rescue the life. My brothers and sisters, if one should wander, somebody go get them. Bring them back and it'll be good for you. Now let me warn you here, our tendency is to not do anything in those types of situations. Live and let live. And we aren't generally people who like to be confronted, who like to confront or be confronted about something we've been doing in our lives or a direction that we've taken. But the stakes are so high. The stakes are so high. Another warning. Make sure if you see a friend in Christ wandering. Oh, great. If you see a friend in Christ wandering away from the faith, don't go tell others about it. That's called gossip and condemned in Scripture. Pray earnestly about it first. Ask God to help you examine your motives. Why are you confronting this lifestyle? Is it good? 
elevate yourself or is it to help that person? And if it's to help that person, then you pray that God gives you the right timing and words to communicate your concern through love. And I always remember this. His promise still stands. His promise still stands. Great is his faithfulness. Faithfulness. We're still in his hands. This is our confidence. And how can we be how can we be so confident? Because he's never failed yet. He's never failed. If God wants a relationship with you, if you don't have one, come on up. I'm afraid about that. You can accept Christ this morning. If you're in need of healing, you can come forward and uh, or remain where you are and raise your hand. Some one of us will come pray over you and anoint you. God is in the house. He's still in the business of saving salvation. He's still in the business of impacting us and helping us to live God.